Good evening. evening. Welcome to our worship for tonight. Um, Unusual situation in this sense that normally we have confirmation in the month of May, but um, we did not resume worship publicly until the end of the month, and so confirmation was um, delayed for a number of weeks, and we settled on this weekend. So tonight, uh, Cassidy is here. She's going to share with you her essay uh, that she wrote, uh, but... Her actual confirmation will take place uh, this Sunday, and we are truly thankful uh, for the blessings that we have received this month in in that respect. A couple of weeks ago, first Sunday this month, we had the joy of bringing four people into the congregation through our adult class, and tonight, uh, this weekend, uh, Cassidy will become a communicant member as well. So what blessings we have received, and we pray that uh, they will be blessed as well. In light of that, we're going to be taking a look at a Psalm of David, portion of Psalm uh, 37. And tonight, um, as I, the message uh, for confirmation is often directed toward the confirmand, um, but I want you to take this as a message that's directed to you as well, um, because uh, what is always addressed to our confirmands is a a wonderful reminder to all of us uh, when We took that promise uh, before the Lord to remain faithful uh, until our death as well. So with that in mind, let's bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, um, we thank you for this time together this evening. As we have an opportunity to be encouraged by David uh, to remain faithful, uh, to shepherd our faith, to nourish it. And that's what we seek to do tonight by the power of your spirit. Let he work in our hearts that we might gain wisdom, our faith might be increased, and our joy in serving you might be seen in all that we do. Let that be true of our worship tonight as we ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. This evening we begin our worship with the singing of hymn number 596. Please rise. 
In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. O Lord, hear my prayer. Listen to my cry for mercy. Do not bring your servant into judgment. Answer me quickly, O Lord. My spirit fails. Show me the way I should go. Teach me to do your will. Almighty God, merciful Father, I, a troubled and repentant sinner, confess that I have sinned against you in my thoughts, my words, and my actions. I have not loved you with my whole heart. I have not loved others as I should. I am distressed by the sins that trouble me and am deeply sorry for them. Jesus says to his people, if you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven. His death paid for the guilt of your sins and the sins of the whole world. Do you believe this? Because of the promise of our Savior Jesus, I forgive you all your sins. Be assured that you are a dear child of God and an heir of eternal life. Amen. Let us pray. O Lord, my God, I call to you for help, and you answered me. I thank you for the love you have shown me in Jesus Christ, my Savior. Through him, you have rescued me from the guilt of my sin and given me the peace of forgiveness. Help me fight against temptation. Correct whatever wrongs I can and serve you and those around me with love and good works. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. You may be seated. Tonight's psalm is Psalm 119C. This evening we join in singing the psalm together.
This evening's scripture readings are the readings for the third Sunday after Pentecost. For our first lesson, we turn to the book of the prophet Hosea, the fifth chapter, we begin our reading at verse 15. I will go. I will return to my place until they admit their guilt and seek my face. In their distress, they will earnestly seek me. Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us to pieces, but he will heal us. He has struck us, but he will bandage our wounds. After two days, he will revive us. On the third day, he will raise us up, so that we may live in his presence. Let us acknowledge the Lord. Let us pursue knowledge of the Lord. As surely as the sun rises, the Lord will appear. He will come to us like a heavy rain, like the spring rain that waters the earth. What am I going to do with you, Ephraim? What am I going to do with you, Judah? For your faithfulness is like a morning mist, like early dew that disappears. That is why I cut them to pieces by means of the prophets. I killed them with the words of my mouth. The judgments against you go forth like the light, for I desire mercy, not sacrifice, and the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Here ends our first scripture lesson. As I mentioned last week, our reading for our second lesson from Romans actually begins a long series of readings uh, from Romans. Tonight's reading is taken from the fourth chapter of Romans. We begin our reading at the 18th verse. Hoping beyond what he could expect, he, being Abraham, believed that he would become the father of many nations, just as he was told. This is how many your descendants will be. He did not weaken in faith, even though he considered his own body as good as dead, because he was about a hundred years old. And even though he considered Sarah's womb to be dead, he did not waver in unbelief with respect to God's promise, but he grew strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully convinced that God was able to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. Now the statement, it was credited to him, was not written for him alone, but also for us to whom it would be credited, namely, to us who believe in the one who raised our Lord Jesus from the dead. He was handed over to death because of our trespasses, and he was raised to life because of our justification. Here ends our reading from Romans. Please rise for a reading from the Gospels. For our Gospel reading this evening, we turn to Matthew's Gospel, the ninth chapter. We begin reading at the ninth verse. In our reading, Jesus will quote the words of the prophet in our first lesson. As Jesus went on from there, he saw a man named Matthew sitting in the tax collector's booth. He said to him, follow me. Matthew got up and followed him. As Jesus was reclining at the table in Matthew's house, many tax collectors and sinners were actually there too, eating with Jesus and his disciples. When the Pharisees saw this, they said to his disciples, Why does your teacher eat with tax collectors and sinners? When Jesus heard this, he said to them, The healthy do not need a physician, but the sick do. Go and learn what this means. I desire mercy and not sacrifice. In fact, I did not come to call the righteous, but sinners. Here ends our reading from the Gospels. Tonight we join in making confession of our Christian faith, this Christian faith which on Sunday Cassidy will confess before the congregation and promise her faithfulness to, a confession that all of us have made a promise to remain faithful to as well. Now join in making confession of our Christian faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven 
and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Our next hymn for this evening is the hymn that Cassidy chose as her confirmation hymn, Hymn number 597, May God the Father of our Lord. As I mentioned at the beginning of our service, uh, the basis of our study for tonight is the 37th Psalm. We wish to consider verses 3 through 7. I read then Psalm 37, 3 through 7. Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on faithfulness. Take pleasure in the Lord and he will grant you, grant your heart's desires. Commit your way to the Lord, trust in him, and he will act. He will make your righteousness shine like light, your justice like noon. Be silent before the Lord, wait patiently for him. Do not fret when an evil man succeeds in his ways, when he carries out his wicked schemes. We bow our heads in prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that in your grace you have given us these words for our learning we pray that by the power of your spirit, we may gain greater insight and understanding, that we do not allow the chaos and disruption of this world keep us from keeping our eyes fixed on you. We pray especially for Cassidy as we think about the wonderful blessings you've given her in the past and as she moves forward now in her faith, that these words be an encouragement to her as she begins this new journey in her faith and in her service to you. We ask these things in our Savior's name. Amen. If you're ever familiar with the movie, It's a Wonderful Life, we actually have two individuals in that movie who are bankers. They are two very different people, if you know the movie. On the one hand, you have this character by the name of Mr. Potter. Now, Mr. Potter is a man who is driven by greed, a man who is driven to gain power. His goal in life was to gain complete troll of the entire town. Mr. Potter, however, had a problem in reaching that goal. And the problem that he had was the Bailey family. A man by the name of Peter Bailey began a savings and loan in the town, a savings and loan that caused great competition for him. And Peter Bailey's 
desire to open up this savings and loan was just the opposite of that of Mr. Potter. His goal was not to become a wealthy man, to not gain power in the town. His goal was to help out his fellow citizens of Bedford Falls. The result was is that his life was one of great struggle. His family lived very modestly. He was not a wealthy man when he died. And in the process of all of this, Mr. Potter just got more and more frustrated. Now, when Peter Bailey died, Mr. Potter thought he was his chance. But as it turned out, his son took over. If you're familiar with the movie, his name is George. And George reluctantly takes over the position of his father because this was not really something he wanted to do in his life. And what he found himself doing was slipping right into the pattern of life that his father had. He lived in a drafty old house. He didn't have much to speak of. And every day he found himself tussling with Mr. Potter. Well, Potter soon realized if he was going to reach his goal, he had to get rid of George Bailey. And how is he going to do that? Well, he lured him into his office one day, and he made him this extraordinary proposal giving him a three-year contract of money George would never have dreamt of making ever in a lifetime. Mr. Potter points out to him, hey, you take this job opportunity I'm giving to you, you can live into a move into a nice home, you can travel around the world, you can give your family fine things. As he's sitting there, thinking about this, as you might well assume, it's very tempting. A good life. Able to do the things that he would want to do. His family would have good things. And for a brief moment, George was inclined to take the offer. Until he started thinking about it. And all of a sudden he realized this was a buyout. And for George it was a sellout. If George was going to accept this, he was going to be giving up all the principles he had been raised on. He was going to give up everything about whom he was. He knows that if he accepts this offer, he would be giving up the life that his father wanted him to have. This coming Sunday, Cassidy, you are going to be making a very bold confession before this congregation. You've got to be making a confession that in Christ and in Christ alone you have eternal life. You're going to state that from this day forward you are going to be guided by one thing in your life and that is the scriptures. Why? Because you've come to know them as God's word and as God's truth to us and that he never lies to us. You're going to state that the only thing of real value that you have now or ever will have in your lifetime is what Christ has earned for you through his perfect life, his innocent suffering and death, and has been assured to you by his resurrection. You're going to promise to remain faithful to this message. In fact, you're going to make a promise that you would rather give up your life than to forsake the Lord Jesus Christ. You're going to promise to remain faithful faithful in hearing God's word, studying God's word, receiving the blessings that he gives to you in the sacrament through his body and blood. But the path that you are embarking on is not an easy one. It's a lot like George Bailey sitting there in Mr. Potter's office. You're going to find yourself faced with a lot of different offers that the devil and the world and even your own sinful flesh are going to put before you. And all of these things are going to promise you wonderful things. But behind all of these promises, these temptations are going to ask you to give up what you boldly are about to confess on Sunday morning before this congregation. It's going to be a path that's going to lead you away from your faith. It's going to be a path that's going to lead you away from the principles that you have learned through your study of God's word. What you'll end up doing is forsaking Jesus. And you're going to forsake that future that he has promised to you in his eternal kingdom. Let me share with 
all of you something I read this week in a sermon that was written by a Lutheran pastor to his confirmands. He had 10 young people on that particular Sunday. And here's just a small portion of what he wrote. He said, this may be difficult to hear, but bear with me. After the last two years of classes and studying and learning about faith, a lot of you, maybe even most of you, will not come back to church very often after next Sunday. A few of you might become regular and active church members, but likely not many. And after today, there will be a lot of things, a lot of other options that will pull you and that pull all of us away from the church and away from our faith. What he says in that paragraph is not an exaggeration. In fact, what he says in that paragraph is a fear that every Christian pastor has on the day of confirmation, whether it's youth or whether it's from the adult class. The longer that an individual is in the ministry, the longer you become very much aware of the fact that many people make these promises, adults and youth, but many of those same people never keep those promises, and they fall away from their faith. So how do you see to it, Cassidy, that you're not one of these statistics? How do all of us see to it that we don't become one of these statistics? Davis, David gives us the answer in the psalm. Shepherd your faith. The devil begins his work in all of us by trying to frustrate us. And you know how he does that? He does it with the so-called success of the wicked around us. David begins this psalm with these words. He says, do not fret because of evildoers. Do not be envious of those who do wrong. For like grass, they will wither quickly. Like green plants, they will wilt. I think all of us would agree that we have become frustrated in the course of our lives at times. And by the way, this is something you see often in the Psalms expressed. We become frustrated over the fact that we look at the world, we see these ungodly people, we see these unbelievers, these people who out and out reject God, and what's happening in their lives? They're prospering. Everything seems to be going their way. We see people, for instance, in the illegal drug trade who have money all over the place living this high life, and they seem to never get caught. Unbelievers do many bad things, and yet they don't ever seem to be punished. They seem to get by with it. So what's the use of us as God's people doing those things which are right in the sight of God? All of this seems to be extremely unfair. Our flesh reasons that, well, if they get by with it, we might as well do the same thing. David reminds us that when our minds start working that way, that we're being very foolish. And we're definitely being very short-sighted in our thinking. He wants us to see that the wicked might enjoy themselves, might find happiness in their sins, and they may even have great wealth, but all of this is temporary. Even if these people, during the course of their lifetimes here, appear to escape any form of justice, we have to understand that there is a court in which no one will escape justice. That day comes when we have to leave this world and we have to stand before the Almighty God and He is going to judge us on that day. In Psalm 1, the psalmist compares the life of the unbeliever and the, and the believer. As he talks about the wicked, he says in Psalm 1, Not so the wicked. No, they are like the chaff which the wind blows away. Therefore the wicked will not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the assembly of the righteous. The way of the wicked will perish. If that's true, then why would you and I be jealous of someone who is heading to hell? That's just foolishness, isn't it? Well, the trip, the journey, Cassidy, that you're going to be embarking upon is a rough and dangerous one. We think about it from a spiritual standpoint. We certainly don't have to look very hard and long in the world today even in our own country, 
You see the other utter chaos that is taking place. The devil has been working overtime, creating extreme chaos. As the Lord gives us direction for our future, he's telling us that our first objective in life, our main objective in life, is to have a relationship with him, and that as each day goes by, that relationship needs to be strengthened. And so I say to you, shepherd your faith. Now, let's see exactly what that means. In verse 3, the first verse of our text, David writes, Trust in the Lord and do good. Dwell in the land and feed on faithfulness. Now, the last part of this verse that says feed on faithfulness, that's where I got the theme for our, our message here this evening. Because this term in the Hebrew can be translated a number of different ways. Really, all of them come to mean the same thing. Let's take a look at some of the things that this term can mean. The first thing is shepherd faithfulness. And what we mean by that is take care of your faith in God and take care to be faithful to others. Another way you can look at this term is shepherd faithfully. A third way, feed on faithfulness. That's what the EHV chose as their translation. Enjoy security. Enjoy safe pasture. When you take a look at all of them, what they're saying is take care of your faith. Don't let this be something that you take for granted. Let it be something that is a concern of yours every day of your life. Now, what is that going to involve? Well, I ask you, how is it that you've come to believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior? How is it that you've come to know this truth about yourself and about what Christ has done for you? Well, it's not because Cassidy's so smart, and it's not because the rest of us are so smart. It's not because somehow we got gifts that the rest of the world doesn't have. We've come to this realization. We've come to this truth because of God's grace. Paul spoke of how it is we've come to faith when he said, Therefore I am informing you that no one speaking by God's Spirit says, A curse be on Jesus. And no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is the one who gave you life. He gave you life in your baptism. When he joined you with Christ in his death, and he joined you with Christ in his resurrection. And at that time, he gave to you spiritual life. He gave to you a new heart and a new mind. I would say a heart and a mind that finally works. Works properly. He restored in you that which Adam and Eve lost in their fall into sin. That image of God. Take care of it. And you'll take care of it by treasuring God's word. Make it a part of your daily life. Treasure the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. That's the place where Jesus is coming to you and he's given you his very body and blood. That body and blood that was given at Calvary for the forgiveness of all your sins. Sins which you and I pile up on a daily basis. It reminds you that one, it reminds you of how much Jesus really loved you, that he was willing to give his life in your place, even though he had done absolutely nothing wrong, and we had done absolutely nothing right. It'll also remind you of that day when you are going to be with him in his eternal kingdom, and in that kingdom you're going to sit down at a banquet, another feast, a feast that is going to go on for all eternity. Shepherd that faith. As that passage that I gave to you as your confirmation verse from Colossians states, keep your eyes focused on Jesus. Don't let him out of your sight. Take good care of that precious gift that he has given to you. And then what will you be able to do? Well, now that takes us to the next verse. He, you are going to be able to trust in the Lord. You know, Solomon said, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. During your lifetime, as you've already experienced up to this time, your flesh wants to rule your life. And it wants to take you in a direction that is not toward Christ, but away from Christ. And then there is that thing that has gripped so many people in the months uh, uh, prior to today, and is still gripping so many people, and it is that terrible thing called fear. And it's going to want to lead you to make bad decisions. It's going to want to lead you to put your trust in the things you have and in your capabilities and the things around you. But David is saying, if you shepherd your faith, you will put your trust in the Lord. 
And if that is the case, then what you will, will you be able to do? Well, he goes on to say, take pleasure in the Lord and he will grant you your heart's desires. You know, it's interesting about the 37th Psalm. The 37th Psalm is very similar to the 73rd Psalm. That's kind of hard to say because that's flipping the numbers. Uh, 37th Psalm and the 73rd Psalm. But go home tonight and read the 73rd Psalm and you'll see how similar they are. And in that 73rd Psalm, here's what the psalmist wrote. Who else is there, in heaven, is there for me in heaven? And besides you, I desire no one else on earth. If you're placing your trust in the Lord, and as you grow in your faith, as you're shepherding that faith, what's gonna, what are you going to experience? You're going to take pleasure in the Lord. You're going to realize he's the only one who brings you true and lasting pleasure, real pleasure. When you have Christ, then you've got everything. To shepherd your faith, you're going to need to do this. David writes in the fifth verse, commit your way to the Lord. Trust in him and he will act. He will make your righteousness shine like light, your justice like noon. The word that is translated here in the EHV, commit, has a basic meaning of roll over. And in the English, we have that expression, uh, turn over, you know, hand over something. And what David is saying here is we need to turn our life over to Christ. Peter wrote something to this respect when he said in 1 Peter 5, cast all your anxiety on him because he cares for you. Turn your life over to Jesus. And when you do, then you're going to experience that peace which the world cannot experience. You're going to see that your life is going to become a blessing. A blessing to you, a blessing to the people around you, and it's going to be a blessing to the gospel message. And you know what I mean by that? You will be a witness to the world. You're going to be that light to the world, as David speaks of. Jesus speaks of that in the Sermon on the Mount, when he says, in the same way, let your light shine in people's presence so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father who is in heaven. Remember, too, the words recorded by Paul, a passage that you memorized in the course of the last two years when he said, so whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do everything to the glory of God. This happens when we turn our life over to Christ and let the Spirit do his work in our life through the power of the gospel. Finally, David says, you shepherd that faith by being silent before the Lord. Wait patiently for him. Do not fret when an evil man succeeds in his ways, when he carries out his wicked schemes. How do you understand being silent before the Lord? First of all, I think of this. You know, it's often said, the Lord gave us two ears and one mouth. A lot of times we use this more than we use these, right? And it's always an important reminder to us that we need to listen first before we speak. The other thing that I think of in res respect to being silent before the Lord is that in the course of life, we can be very upset emotionally. Our emotions can run away from us, and as you probably, most of you have experienced with a, with a young child, if they get hysterical, there's no point in trying to speak to them because they're not going to hear a word you're saying. So what the Lord is saying to us is that we need to come into his presence, but when we come into his presence, we need to be quiet. We need to be quiet so that we listen to what he has to say. The psalmist in Psalm 46 said something similar. He said, be still and know that I am God. And by the way, those words, be still, are spoken to the unbelievers who are raging against God's people. And he's telling them, hey, knock it off for a second and listen up. I'm going to tell you something. But he's also saying this to God's people who potentially are worked up by the things that are going on around them. He says, be still and know that I am God. In other words, I am in control. He says, I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted on the earth. The Lord of armies is with us. The God of Jacob is a fortress for us. God is the one who is in control. And that's why it's important for you every day to be quiet and let him listen to you so that you are reminded of who is control, in control of your life and in control of everything around you so that you can proceed each day in a peace and a hope that can only be found in the Lord Jesus Christ. Cassidy, I don't know if you can appreciate what a joy and experience, uh, 
pleasure it will be on Sunday, not only for me, who's had the privilege of meeting with you for the last two years and taking you through Luther's small catechism, but for all the members of this congregation to hear your bold confession in the Lord Jesus Christ. What we want to all urge you to do is to shepherd this faith that God has graciously given to you. We pray for you that God will give you the strength and power to keep these promises that you will be making on Sunday. But I also want you to know this. We not only are here for you, it brings us great joy to know you are here for us. That you are here to pray for us as well. You are here to offer us encouragement also. May God bless you as you in your life shepherd this faith that God has graciously given to you in the Lord Jesus Christ. We pray that God will grant you many rich blessings and that you will be a wonderful part of his kingdom in extending that kingdom into the lives of others. Amen. May the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, keep your hearts and minds through faith in Christ Jesus. Amen. Rite of Confirmation is going to take place on Sunday morning, but this evening Cassidy um, would like to share with you the essay that she has prepared um, and will be reading on Sunday as well. Her essay is based upon the passage that I gave to her from Colossians chapter 3. Colossians 3, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, because you were raised with Christ, seek the things that are above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Set your minds on things above, not earthly things. What do you think of when you hear you were raised with Christ? We think of how he died on the cross to take away our sins so we can get into heaven, and then on the third day he was raised again. When he rose from the dead, all of our sins were taken away and we were forgiven. We are no longer spiritually dead, but we are spiritually alive in Christ and in his word. We are new people. We have new hearts, minds, and with those new minds and hearts, we should want to live our lives perfectly every day like Jesus. We now have the responsibility to share his word to others. Through our baptism, we have washed away our old self, and by daily repentance, we have put on the new self. Through this baptism, our old self died with Christ, and a new person was born through Christ so that we may now live with our Father eternally. In this life, we do not set our minds on things of this world, but live for Christ who died for all, that we may have eternal life in his kingdom. For we should keep our eyes fixed on Jesus and not let them wander. We can do this by staying in his word and always learning new ways to praise him so our eyes do not wander. For he is our Savior, Redeemer, and our guidance, and we were raised with him. I ask you to please rise, and now we offer our prayers on behalf of Cassidy as we join in praying the responsive prayer. Gracious Father, you have adopted Cassidy in baptism and anointed her with your Holy Spirit. Renew and strengthen her by that same Spirit so that she may continue to grow in faith and boldly confess you before others. Lord, in your mercy, Move her to faithfully hear your holy word and joyfully receive your sacrament that she may again and again be assured of your gracious love and forgiveness. Lord, in your mercy, give her the sincere desire to die each day to sin and put on the new self created to be like God in true righteousness and holiness. Lord, in your mercy, Clothe her with the kindness, humility, and patience of Christ, and so that she may live it at peace with all the members of Christ's body. Lord, in your mercy, protect her from the powers of evil and give her the weapons to fight against the devil. Lord, in your mercy, 
Keep her faithful and holy so that she may inherit eternal life through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We also join in praying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. O God, you work in us to will and to act according to your good purpose. Strengthen us in soul and body that we may do what is pleasing to you and beneficial to all people. Compel us by the self-sacrificing love of Christ and empower us by the gifts of your Holy Spirit to be witnesses of your gospel in our words and in our actions. We ask this in the name of your Son, who came not to be served but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for all. Amen. May the love of the Lord Jesus draw us to himself. May the power of the Lord Jesus make us strong to do his will. May the peace of the Lord Jesus fill our lives. Amen. You may be seated. We close this evening's service with hymn number 588. We sing verses 7 through 8. That's not right. 5 through 7. Let's try that. Once again, good evening. Welcome to everyone, to our visitors. We extend a very special welcome. We'd ask you to please sign our guest book as you leave, and it is our sincere prayer that you return to worship with us again in the future. One of the things that's been available um, in the back of the church are um, small sanitizer bottles, and um, we were able to uh, actually get those at no cost. Uh, Kevin Pockrant works at Perigo. Um, and they're a pharmaceutical company who actually, you've purchased their products, uh, generic over-the-counter drugs uh, sold at Meyer, Walgreens, 
um, but they switched over to making hand sanitizer during this time. And Kevin reached out to them and uh, they graciously gave us four boxes of them. So um, as I was thinking about it, I didn't mention it to you last Thursday, I mentioned it to the group on Sunday, but just take a bottle, um, that way you have it with you. Um, it would be your personal bot. doesn't mean that you can only use it here. You can use it if you run out, grab another one, okay? But um, please be uh, reassured you're welcome to, to take one. Uh, this next week on Tuesday evening, our Board of Elders will meet at 7 o'clock and Church Council will meet at 8 o'clock over in the Education Building. So uh, take note of that. You have a Wells Together um, publication so that's available to you. And I would just say um, before we leave that I'm sure we obviously, um, because of circumstances, Cassidy's not gonna be back there and you're not gonna be shaking your hand and all that good stuff. But even though that's not gonna happen, um, know that they wish you the Lord's richest blessings. Um, she was worked up about this all year, okay? That she was all alone. I told her she wasn't special. Others have been in this situation before. But then in the same breath, she was special, you know, so, um, and I could tell through the whole sermon, all you could think about was you had to come up here and read this essay, okay? I expect a little more eye contact on Sunday morning, okay? So, I think she probably felt like I did the first time I preached in, uh, ever preached in a church, and it was, you know, foolishly, at my home congregation, um, and I can remember sitting, I was sitting on this side in the front of the church, and I was wishing there was about 15 verses to that hymn um, before I, now I actually want to get up there as soon as the service starts, but back then I wasn't so quick to rush to the pulpit. So, um, so you, I told you, they don't bite, see? They're generally pretty good. So just a reminder, I will start dismissing in the back of the church. So have a blessed weekend.